Okay, so my subject today is Postgres. Um, you'll see what the thing is about, um, but generally I will talk about serverless and more specifically a different approach to serverless. Um, okay, so who is this? Uh, I'm Stoyan. I work at Supabase. Some of you or many of you probably have, have heard about it. We use Postgres, so that's why I'm going to talk about it, but this is not an advertisement for Superbase. So this is on my own. Um, I work there on the OAuth system, which kind of works well with uh, what I'm going to talk about today. And if you have any questions at the end, uh, because I couldn't get t-shirts and things on time here, um, you get like a t-shirt and some other swag. Uh, this swag, by the way, costs quite a lot. It's half a million for this one. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you can just give me your address, or if you don't want to give me your address, um, just let me know how I can contact you, and when the stuff arrives, I will give it to you. Okay. So, what is serverless? Uh, if you follow Twitter these days, um, it's really all over the place. Everyone's redefining serverless. There's Vercel that does something uh, in that regard. There's Supabase that does something else. There's Neon. There, there are lots of other uh, companies that are sort of trying to redefine what serverless means. But I will uh, stick to this sort of definition, this is the ability to create apps um, on any platform without writing APIs or managing servers, uh, which kind of doesn't like fit with, um, with what I'm going to talk about, but it's doable. Um, okay, so what is the current state of the world uh, when you think about serverless? So we all know about Firebase. This was probably the first uh, popular serverless example. Um, it got acquired by Google with very few users, and it's still active. It still drives quite a lot of applications, especially in the, in the mobile space. Um, but it does have quite a lot of drawbacks. So, for example, their database is completely uh, unrelated to any other database in the world. It only got the ability to count entries in the database, just like three or four months ago. <laughs> so it's not very useful in many typical respects, but it is useful when you want to scale. AWS have their own thing, which is this thing called AppSync, which no one uses because it's unusable. Um, it's a mix of Cognito and DynamoDB, and if you really try to make it work, it will work. Uh, but it still sort of has the same issues with uh, the Firebase product from Google. So uh, doing basic data analysis on your database is very hard. You have to sort of write your own uh, server that downloads all the data and all of that, which is kind of defeats the point of having servers, serverless. So that brings me to my next point. Can we actually do better? So first, can we avoid this vendor lock-in that Firebase uh, and AWS have, have put on us? So once you build something for AWS with their AppSync and DynamoDB stuff, or you work on something with Firebase, that's it. You can't sort of take your data. You can download like a massive JSON file, and then what? Um, so it's once you go in, you can't get out. Um, there's also the costs of operation. So when you are starting to build your app, it feels like it's going to go very well. Uh, it's very cheap to start, especially with Firebase. Uh, even if you make any mistakes, it, it won't eat, eat up all your budget. Um, but that actually is not uh, that great, because once you go past a certain point or you need something more um, something that has more performance or um, you're getting a lot of users, it's very hard to actually keep up with the monetary cost of running this thing. Uh, there's also the cost of development. So you have to find people that have experience with AWS or with Firebase, which is very hard to do and especially to find good people. 
And so we can, why don't we just like use what everyone's taught at school, right? Why don't we use uh, SQL and a regular database to do all of this? And so that's basically what Postgres is. Uh, so it's a server, it's written in Haskell, if anyone uh, cares. Um, and it turns your Postgres SQL database into a complete REST API. And um, you basically, I feel like this changed, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> you basically don't need anything else. So you have this database that has quite a lot of functionality, and it does actually have quite a lot. The problem is we rarely see this in, um, in everyday life because these are features that were added without having a holistic solution that helps you sort of see how useful they can be. And this is where actually Postgres comes in and solves uh, much of this. And you'll see uh, that in a minute. Um, because, as I mentioned, Superbase uses Postgres in the background. Um, this will look like an advertisement for Superbase, but trust me, you can do this all on your own. I don't have enough time in 20 minutes to set everything up correctly, so I'm just going to use the Superbase uh, database and uh, the tools uh, there, but you can sort of not use Superbase if you don't want to. Okay, so what what is actually Postgres? So basically, it's a... Um, it's this layer of an HTTPS REST server that uh, enables all these types of apps, so single page app, iOS, Android, backend servers as well, to talk to the Postgres database with um, an HTTP um, request. And this does actually follow the supposed REST rules that no one actually can agree on. Um, <laughs> But it does sort of follow the, the typical structure, and it does make sense when you're trying to sort of build something, you typically start writing an API. And that API usually has the shape of our wrists, um, like resources and things. So with this, you don't actually have to do that. You just use whatever's in the database, which is typically what you do. Um, and so you don't need to invest time in writing that translation layer. Okay, so it doesn't work with other databases, um, but I honestly, like, if someone wants to do this for MySQL, I think you can do it. It's very easy to do. Um, and you'll be very popular when you do that. Okay, so let's look at an example of how Postgres works. Um, I hope this is readable, so let me know if it's not. Um, okay, so first let's uh, do the to-do <laughs> model view controller example. Um, let's imagine there's a table, and this table uh, contains a list of, or contains to-dos. Uh, and so it's a very basic SQL database. So it, uh, table, it has like, um, like an ID, which is a UUID. Always use UUID. Don't ask me why. Um, then there's like a text, which is the text of the to-do. There's like a completed Boolean, whether the to-do got completed, and like a created app just because. Um, and so this uh, table can be queried in this way. So maybe I should zoom in a bit more. Um, so basically, it follows REST rules. If you want to list all of the items or list one item, you use a GET request. You do slash to-dos. And then you can say, for example, if you want to look at all the completed to-dos, completed equals is dot false. Now, this syntax comes from the Haskell background of Postgres, but actually is quite um, usable because it doesn't force um, like the URI encoding. So you can like even do this in curl and it, it's very easy to do. Um, and you can do that for uh, if you want to look at the completed, non-completed ones. If you want to order, it's just like ordering. And you get actual pagination, so you can do limits and offsets, which you really can do with Firebase. Um, to insert something, again, REST rules, so you just like post uh, to the endpoint. And the good thing about um, Postgres is it actually supports almost any content type usable on the web today. So if you don't want to use JSON, you want to do the form posting. So you can have like a completely static 
HTML form, and it will accept form encoded um, payloads as well. Um, updating is similar, so the difference is you have to specify which um, rows in the database should be updated, and it's uh, again uh, similar uh, to can that go away? Um, similar to like the querying syntax. Okay, so because this is a JavaScript conference, that's the REST stuff. But how does this look in, in JavaScript, right? Um, so it's there's a Postgres JS library which is actually underpinning the Superbase JS library, which I will show in a live example later. Um, but just think about like Superbase equals Postgres at this time. Um, and so it basically is like a, you have this Postgres client, you specify the database, and you do a select, and it returns everything uh, about it. You can do joins very easily as well, so it's no weird SQL syntax. You just like specify, I want the sub objects of this, and it will uh, fetch them for you. I don't have enough time to show every feature <laughs> that this has. Um, OK, so that's querying. You can do uh, like the query syntax. You don't have to know it. You can just like use types to, to get autocomplete and stuff. Uh, to insert stuff, again, the same uh, pattern. And updating, uh, same thing as well. OK, so I prepared a live example. Um, and hopefully, that has not crashed. Um, Let's see. So design skills, non-existent at this time. Uh, <laughs> so basically, this is the add to do item. And I can do something like, um, do I have enough time? And so when I press Enter, it's actually going into the database. I will show you the code, how that works. Um, and it, then it loads it directly from the database using REST uh, all the time. So basically, if I go into the table, which should load in a minute if it's not crashing. OK, so this is the table. Um, this is a bug in Superbase. <laughs> that very responsive. Uh, OK, <laughs> so. I don't know. <laughs> Why does it do this? Um, so basically, it's all the rows. Maybe I can do this. Uh, this might be better. OK, so here are all the to-dos, right? Um, OK, so let's, let's look at the code that the window is gone again. But um, OK, so what does the code look like? Um, I literally built this in like two hours. So basically, you need to initialize the client. In Superbase, this is just the URL of your project. Uh, but if you want to use Postgres directly, you still have to supply the URL um, that you're hosting Postgres on. And there are other server uh, services that just like host Postgres if you want to. So if you already have a normal database, AWS database, um, it will kind of just work. You just need the connection string. So very basic example. We have the to-do state. We have the text state for entering email password. I, I'll show you, show you that thing. So basically, to load all the to-dos, you do that. You select from the table, and you specify the order. And then you just put that in the React state. Um, and use effect hate me or not. Um, so when you load the page, loads everything from the database. Um, right, so how does entering look like? Um, hold on, let me get to that. OK, so when you press Enter on the input field, uh, you insert in the database, you reload everything from the database at once, just kind of works. Um, and then. If you want to list all the to-dos, you just like go through the state. And if you toggle the, the check change uh, thing, you can update based on the ID of 
of the um, of the to do. Okay, so that kind of looks very nice, but if if someone um, I don't know macOS, like how do I even move this? Wait, I think I know. Hold on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I need to find the thing. Okay, there it is. <laughs> okay. I usually use Linux and I'm forced against my will to use Mac OS. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so if you notice here, um, anyone can just like basically add to do's to my website and they will not get filtered. So I think this is the most important bit um, with Postgres. In that, let me get to load to do's. Okay, so loading the to do's, you see there's no user ID here. How do I prevent other users from seeing my to do's, right? So this is the most powerful thing in Postgres, and it's enabled because Postgres, I know it's, it's difficult. Um, <laughs> you should see our conversations at work. Um, <laughs> is that with a REST or <laughs> no REST? Um, so if you, like this is the most powerful thing, how do I filter based on the user? And it's enabled because of a thing called role level security policies in uh, Postgres, the database. So what does that mean? Uh, basically, each request you send to Postgres um, can have like a authorization header, like a JWT or something. Um, then Postgres takes that JWT and infers what the user behind it is. And so we can very quickly um, set something up. So if I go into the table, which you have to, I guess, suffer through this. Um, if I go to the table and um, hold on. So if I go to the table, uh, there's this thing called enable role level security. So what this means is that if there is such a header on the um, request to Postgres, you, the Postgres will sort of infer who the user is. And if this is disabled, you don't get that. There is a SQL statement for this. I just don't want to show it because it's ugly. Um, that, that's why this company exists, right? Um, <laughs> so you just click a button. OK, so once you, you have uh, RLS enabled, then you need to set up something called a policy. So basically saying this table can be used with Postgres, but now I need to filter based on the rows um, in the table. So here, as you can see, there is no user ID association. So what I can do here is do user ID. And this uses Superbase auth in the background. It is not mandatory to use Superbase auth. You can use auth0 or clerk or whatever one of the ones you have, but do use Superbase auth. Um, <laughs> and um, it, right, so in Superbase auth, these are UUIDs, so that's why you set up UUID. And we can say um, this shouldn't be nullable, so a to-do always has to have a user. But um, in order for us to always know what the user is, we can call this function called auth.uid. So auth user ID. So anything, any time um, a new entry is inserted into the database, Postgres will look up the user ID from the header and put it into the table. So save. OK, I don't know what that error is. <laughs> uh, let's see this it got applied. It did not. Um, Uh, 
and where is it? Okay. It's I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Hold on. Let's try SQL. I tried this before, so I guess it's broken. Um, I don't remember what the syntax was. Um, okay, so I think that created it, and Okay, five columns, okay, that's working fine. Okay, so now when I do the insert, you will see the user IDs. Uh, oh, you know why it didn't work? Because it was non-null, and I already had entries. Um, okay, so now if I do test, test, and I input that, and we go into the table, so uh, select. Test test is here, and the most important bit, my user ID is in that. So basically with this, uh, you can filter by user IDs, and you can build very powerful filtering um, on top of your database, which sort of solves 99% of all of the uh, app building problems you might have. Okay, so I think that's about it. I don't have that much time left. If there are any questions, now's the time. Okay, okay, let's go. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, what about complex queries? Um, right, so there are two types of complex queries in real life, really. Uh, they are joins, and you might have something that is more like a backend function where you're trying to fill up missing data or things like that. So for the joins, there is very nice Postgres um, syntax which automatically joins, and you can do like left joins, right joins, normal joins, all of that. Um, and you don't have to know any SQL for that to work. Um, in addition to that, you get the RLS system in place. So basically, if you join with a table that has other users' content, it will filter out the, the content for the other users. Um, so that, that is al already kind of solved. The backend functions, you can actually use Postgres from your backend without writing any SQL. So if you send a specific type of uh, authorization header, you can basically have um, like a HTTP SQL from your regular admin backend, for example. So you don't have to write any SQL to, to do any of those complex data manipulation stuff. Um, I believe there's also a special endpoint where you can send raw SQL to have that executed, but don't use that. Um, and there's also um, functions, so, oh, God, it went away. Um, there's also functions, like regular <laughs> database functions, and with uh, Postgres SQL, you can write functions in, like, SQL, the, the complex SQL, PLPGS SQL, or you can use like uh, Python or JavaScript as well. Um, so any co complex logic you have, you can write as a function and then execute it via uh, Postgres. Um, that's, I think, slash RPC slash the name of the function, and it kind of does that. So that's kind of the, the three ways to do that. Uh, OK, thank you, Stoyan, for the great presentation. And uh, great choice of editor, by the way, for code editor. Um, Thank you. I have many questions, but uh, I think I will ask the simplest one, which is uh, you talked about the drawbacks of Firebase, DynamoDB, and whatnot. I will not ask about the drawbacks of Superbase, but the drawbacks of Postgres. Um, right, so I guess the, one of the problems 
with Postgres is that it's Haskell based and it is an actual server. Um, <laughs> you were not expecting this, I know. Um, the, that's the, the issue with this is that Haskell like, uh, is, is kind of difficult for people to configure and run. So running it yourself might be a bit m too involved. But that's why there are lots of services online. There are ready-made images, all of that, that already pre-configure this um, for you. And I guess the other drawback is really not being able to have um, transactions in the sense of uh, like a transactional dialogue with the database. Like you, like you do a begin, and then you select some data, then do some processing, then do something and then do commit or rollback. That's not possible. So I guess that's one of the drawbacks. But I guess that's also a strength as well. Um, it forces you to not um, sort of use very long transactions to do basic uh, data processing, which is typically common with backend programming, right? So if you, I guess from that point of view, if you just replace all your SQL in your backend with Postgres, you're actually gaining a lot more instead of losing on it. Yeah.